Hi everyone, this is Barb Bruno. I want to welcome you to our free webinar today. And our topic today is how do you increase your sales and profits in the next 10 months of 2020? And I want to explain the reason why I'm doing this webinar. I've been at four conferences so far this year uh, and they were recruiting conferences and I keep hearing the same thing. You know, we're hearing the economy is great. We're hearing the job market is tight. Unemployment, it is record lows. And so as a recruiter, you know, we should be having record months in both January and February. And many companies have not hit goals. They've not hit their hiring goals. They're not hitting production goals. And so what I'm hearing from many, um, you know, owners and managers is how do we increase sales and profits for the remaining 10 months, you know, of this year? Now, obviously the coronavirus is also having an impact on the economy worldwide, but that doesn't affect hiring as much as you would think it might. Number one, it's not affecting many countries. Um, it's still not a pandemic and hopefully it won't get there, but business is still good for us because the perfect storm is going on out there. You know, um, and I think there are a couple big changes that happened in January. And I think most of you know that I do training for LinkedIn Learning. I have done 14 courses for LinkedIn Learning. And as a result, I participate in their insider group, which meets monthly. And we get information from LinkedIn that's a result of their big data. And I always like to share it with each of you because you might not have access to all this information. But two major changes happen in January of this year. And I wanna share those with you before we get into our program because they're important for you to know. Number one, millennials are now more than 50% of the workforce. They have been the majority in the workforce for almost two years, but now they represent over 50% of the workforce. And by 2025, millennials will represent 75% um, of the workforce. That's a major change that's going to impact all of you. The other change that happened in January of this year, for the first time in history in the United States, more than 50% of the workforce is not working the traditional 40 hour work week. And so, you know, people are working a combination of two part time jobs. They're working temper contract, they're working as independent contractors. There's a lot of different working, you know, environments that are going on right now. And that's impacting those of us that are in the recruiting profession. And we have to stay ahead of trends. If you want to have a record month, a record year in 2020, and you haven't had a record January or February, you know, then let's talk about very specific things today that you can do that will increase your sales and profits for the coming year. And just so all of you know, the reason I train is so that you can be more successful. I have people ask me all the time, you know, why are you still training? It's because I stay aware of everything. I go to as many conferences as I speak at. I am constantly watching you know, economists, I, I watch the economists that I respect what they're predicting. I'm very aware of trends. And because I speak to corporate audiences, because I speak to the staffing and recruiting profession, and because I do in-house training for many of the top firms in this country, I have inside knowledge that I wanna share with all of you because I see what very successful companies do and I see what unsuccessful companies do. And, and the funny thing is sometimes the unsuccessful companies are working harder. You know, they're just working harder and just not, they're not increasing their profits. So I wanna give you the value of my experience and I only train so that you can become more successful and you can make more money. That's what motivates me. So whenever anybody asks me that question, that's the answer to that question. I want you never to forget when you're in business, whether you're a, an owner or a manager, you're in business to do one thing and that's generate profits. If you don't generate profits for your business, you don't have a business. And I don't know if you know, everybody that's listening to me was in business during 2008 to 2010, but a lot of staffing and recruiting firms went out of business during that recessionary period. And it really did impact our profession harder than any recession I've ever experienced. And the owners that got in trouble were the owners that stopped taking a paycheck we're taking loans and paying people that we're not producing for them. Bottom line is you're in business to generate a profit or you can't do anything. You know, you're gonna lose your business. Secondly, you know, when you go into business or you go into management, you do it because you wanna create a lifestyle that you deserve. You know, you don't wanna blink. I think the, the uh, Kobe Bryant uh, tragedy, I think woke everybody up. And I, the only thing I enjoyed about that was seeing people really put uh, a premium and put attention on the relationship he had with his daughter and the importance of family. 
I just caught some clips last night of their, you know, the uh, memorial service that they did, the celebration of his life. And don't you want your family to do that when something eventually happens to you? You want them to celebrate the life that you enjoyed. And so you never forget that, you know, you're in business, you're doing this, you're in this profession to also create the lifestyle that you deserve and the lifestyle that you want your family and the people that you love to live. You also have to anticipate trends. Trends are coming at us faster than I've ever seen. And you've got to make appropriate changes constantly if you're going to surpass goals that are set. You know, if you don't anticipate a trend, there could be a turn in the road. And if you keep going straight, eventually your competition is going to run right over you because you have got to anticipate trends. It's so important that we stay informed. And the problem is when I go online, there is so much bad information online. I guess that's another reason why I do these webinars, why I keep training, because I take a personal responsibility in everything I'm teaching you. You know, anything that I'm going to tell you today, I've done in my own business. I know it's valid information. I know it will work for you. You know, I would never say something that I know is irrelevant or something that could harm you or your business or the people that work for you. And so again, you know, there's a lot of information out there, but they call it the information highway. And sometimes when I go online, it's more the misinformation, you know, highway. How do you know what to listen to and what's really relevant? There's three keys for every successful staffing and recruiting firm. And those keys are that you have to have a motivated and inspired sales team. If any of you are parents, you know for a fact you can't motivate someone. If you have a child who's in um, um, junior high, <laughs> I have five children, and that was always my most challenging time was that fifth, sixth, and seventh grade and eighth grade, that period of time where, where they sort of declared that they were the boss. You know, you can't really motivate somebody. You have to have an inspired, motivated sales team. You can create a motivating environment but you have to have people on your team that really have that drive and determination coming some for a woman from within. You've got to leverage your time and knowledge. I hear owners and managers complaining all the time that all my time is spent babysitting people. Like I feel like a babysitter. Well, the problem is too often you're spending most of your time on the people that are not working out for you rather than spending most of your time encouraging the people that are performing for you and, and making them even better. You know, sometimes we just, or we do things that are not best use of our time. If you feel like you don't have enough hours in the day, um, by the way, I'm going to give you this recording. And so you will have this recording after the call. So when I'm saying things outside of what's on the screen, I'm going to give you this recording free as well. So you're all going to have this. So don't worry about writing down every single word I say. I'd rather have you listening. But one thing that you could do that would really make a difference this year is in the month of March, do a time study for yourself. So if in fact you're not sure if you're leveraging your time well, I want you to think about what is the 20% of what you do as an owner or manager that generates the most revenue for your business? What do you personally do that helps increase sales and profits? You know, you're the owner, you're the manager. So what do you do that that, that 20% that gives you 80% of your results? Because once you identify that, you have to do more of that 20% and start delegating a lot of the busy work. So my challenge for you, and something I would suggest that all of you do, if time is your issue, you can't manage time. We all have the same 168 hours in a day, and you can't change that. And if I gave you three or four more hours a day, that wouldn't change anything. It's what you're doing within those hours. Are you really focused on those, those functions that are best use of your time? Do a time study in March. Just start, you know, I don't care if you do this on your computer, on a piece of paper, on a legal pad, I don't care what you use. But everything you do, I want you to write it down. And then when you do it, you know, two, three, four times, just put check marks be behind what you've written down and write down every single thing that you're doing. And at the end of March, do this for one month, you know, the whole working month of March, Monday through Friday, write down what you're doing at work. And then the most important part of that, if you want to leverage your time and your knowledge to help your firm succeed, then I want you to number the, the items that you have listed of all the things you do. And I don't want you to put number one as what you're doing most. I want you to put number one as best use of your time. The top 10 things on that list should represent the 20% of what you do that gives you 80% of your results. And then my challenge to you is look at the, the bottom 10 things on that list, and I want you to delegate them to somebody else. And every time I do this, by the way, I do a time study on myself once a year because I can get off track too, 
And I realized that when I'm making the list, when I look at the bottom things, some of those are things I just enjoy doing. Like they're things that don't take a lot of brain power. They're things that I kind of are stress relief things for me. But then I realize that it's not best use of my time and I need to delegate it. And there's so many resources. You know, you could use Fiverr. That's F-I-V-E-R-R. Fiverr is a site of a tremendously large number of freelance workers that'll do anything for $5. I mean, it's amazing the work I've had people at Fiverr do for my business. It's F-I-V-E-R-R or Upwork, U-P-W-O-R-K. Upwork bought Odesk. They bought Elance. Elance was the, the biggest site for freelance writers. Odex had freelancers all over the world. And you can, you can hire people if you don't have people in your current business. You can't afford a lot of money. You don't have a big budget to delegate all these things to. These are people that work at very low hourly rates. And the quality of their work is, is phenomenal. And you can screen them by you only want to use somebody that's had a five-star rating. And so look at Upwork, U-P-W-R-K and Fiverr, F-I-V-E-R-R. If in fact you have nobody to delegate those bottom 10 things to, or what about a working mom that just wants to work 10 hours a week? You know, the, the best thing you could do is take things that are not best use of your time and delegate them. When I first started doing this, I hired one person to work 10 hours a week for me at minimum wage. And I just delegated all the work I knew was not best use of my time. In a relatively short period of time, that person ended up working full time for me because I realized how much I was doing that was preventing me from focused on my focus on sales and profits. And now I have two full time people that do nothing but the things that I shouldn't be doing. The third key for a successful staffing in a recruiting firm is you have to have consistent, repetitive, comprehensive systems. You've got to set up your business like a franchise. Everybody can't be, you know, shooting from the hip and doing things their own way. You've got to set up your business like a franchise. And you've also got to provide consistent, repetitive, and comprehensive training because things keep changing. And what happens to recruiters or salespeople in our profession, they do great. And then eventually they start coming backwards. Their production drops because they haven't changed anything. They're, they're working in their comfort zone. I always tell people, if you don't have a lump in your, in your throat or a knot in your stomach, um, you're not changing anything. You're operating in your comfort zone. I'm hoping that everyone listening to my voice today, you imagine a light switch on your chest and I want you to turn it off. And that's your automatic pilot. I want all of you to become more aware of the decisions you're making and the actions you're taking. And more importantly, the results you're getting. If you're not getting the results you want, then you've got to go back to the decisions you're making and the actions you're taking. You got to change things constantly to just keep up with what's going on out there. And technology continues to drive change faster than anything I've ever seen. So my question is, have you changed the way your recruiters are proactively recruiting top talent? Okay, because recruiting doesn't even resemble what we did two years ago. Have you changed your repeatable client development or sales process? Do you even have a repeatable client development or sales process? Because if you don't, you're going to have details slip through the cracks. You're going to have people ghosting you and you're going to blame candidates. You're going to blame your clients when in essence, it's the lack of you having a set process in place. Have you embraced millennials who are driving change? I think millennials are the most over scrutinized generation I've ever seen in my life. I employ several millennials. They are phenomenal. They are doing a great job for me, but I've taken the time to embrace them and learn what motivates them. And like I told you at the beginning of this, uh, they now represent more than 50% of the workforce. They're also now hiring authorities. And in less than five years, they're going to be 75% of the workforce. You've got to quit judging the millennials and you've got to understand them and embrace the differences. There's no generation that's right or wrong. We all come with our own set of rules and, and what we look for. Um, and none of us is perfect. Trust me. Every generation has weaknesses and strengths. But the millennials now represent over 50% of the talent pool. Um, they're over 50% of the workforce. And so you have got to embrace them. And do you have the right team? And are you providing them with the best training? Now, your answers to these questions do one thing. When you're answering these questions, if you haven't changed the way your recruiters are, are recruiting, if they're still pitching jobs, they got to stop that. It's not working. Um, you know, client development, clients can hire behind, hide behind technology. If you haven't changed these things or embraced millennials, um, the answers to these questions 
really show you where you need to put your attention. The fact that you want higher sales and profits in the last 10 months of this year, is it possible? Yes. Could everyone that works for you do more? Of course they could, but they're not going to do it for your reasons. They're going to do it for their own reasons. And you've got to figure out as the owner or manager, where is it that you need to put your attention? And these are four areas that absolutely need attention because we've changed the way we work our desks. I mean, recruiting and client development doesn't even resemble what it was two years ago. It's very different right now. So if you haven't changed, that could be the reason why you're not enjoying just record sales. Current realities and changes needed to increase sales and profits in the next 10 months. You don't have to look for complicated solutions. I always, when I'm interacting with owners, I had an owner on the phone yesterday and it was interesting because he kept asking me these questions and I was listening to his questions and I finally said to him, why are you overcomplicating your business? And he was like, what? And I said, why are you overcomplicating this business? And he goes, I'm not. And I said, no, you are. You know, what we do for a living is not real complicated. It's just not, but it can become complicated you know, if in fact we're not we're not making changes that we need to make or we're focused on problems and not solutions. All I want you to do is just embrace the following realities and it's going to improve your results because I've mentioned a couple of them, but there's so much going on right now and you've got to embrace all of these. Reality number one is the candidate-driven job market has changed recruiting, period. Candidates are hiding behind technology. However, if they understand the what's in it for me, they will respond to you. If your recruiters are telling you, candidates will not talk to me, clients will not talk to me, all they wanna do is text. What I'm saying back to you is, your recruiters are more comfortable texting, and that's why they'd rather text than have a conversation. I'm telling you, Gen Z, who is the generation after the uh, millennials, they like face-to-face -face interviews, which I'm finding fascinating. They, they like that individual care. I mean, every generation is different, but if people see how you can benefit them, they will respond. And what I want all of you to think about for a moment is every person you interact with all day long, and even after you get home from work, they all have a tattoo on their forehead. And the tattoo is W-I-I-F-M. If you can tell a candidate what's in it for them, how you can benefit them, they will talk to you. If clients understand how you can benefit them, hiring authorities understand, they will talk to you. If your employees understand how you can benefit them, because see, your employees have that same tattoo. If you don't show them how they benefit by working for you, they will go work for someone else. And technology has made it easier for everybody to find a job because of job postings and website postings and social media. People are more well-connected now than they've ever been in their lives. But if you want people to quit hiding behind technology, the only reason they're doing that is they see no value in talking to you and no value in talking to the people that work for you. And so understand that, that yes, they will talk to you if they see the benefit. You've got to quit pitching jobs and your recruiters have got to stop pitching jobs until you determine what's most important to them. I do a call once a week for job seekers and I have roughly 2,000 to 2,500 job seekers on the phone every every week. They don't know who I am. They don't know that I own a recruiting firm. They don't know that I train recruiters. They have no idea who I am. I just go on the phone and go, hi, welcome to this week's job seeker call. And they complain about us all the time. And I can tell you the one thing they hate is when we pitch jobs. I went to four technology conferences last year. And I would ask the audience, how many of you would be willing to look at a new opportunity? And almost every hand went up. Now, you know, why, why are you not taking calls from recruiters? And they go, it's easy. My boss is sitting next to me, my coworkers in front of me, and you're trying to pitch a job that I'm not interested in. And so I'm rude to you. Number one, I can't talk during the day. And number two, don't pitch a job because what I'm doing now is not what I want to do next. See, we assume when we see a LinkedIn profile or we have a resume, we're assuming that what somebody is doing now is what they want to do next. And that's not necessarily true. In order for them to make a change, something has to be going on at their current job that they can't control. So they'll change jobs. But you've got to quit pitching jobs. You've got to have your teams quit pitching jobs until they know what a candidate sees as their next career move. And then you position yourself as as 
the solution to that. So when you're out there making your, when your team is out there, you've got to train them differently now. They've got to quit pitching jobs and they've got to pitch a conversation to discuss what this person sees as their next career move. People will talk to you to tell you what they want to do next. You also need to start identifying new free resources for talent. And where we get some of our best resources and everybody's paying a fortune for all these resources. And as an owner or a manager, you can't afford to keep buying resources because you've got the same resources that everybody else is using. Identify resources that nobody has. Ask your candidates where they go when they're looking for a job. And they'll give you all kinds of free work resources that they're using, free sites that they go to, blogs that they follow. You know, you've got to use what, you've got to know what your candidates are using because again, a candidate's never going to pay for a resource. And so if you identify what they use, you're going to be amazed at the new resources you're going to use to find candidates. I have to ask all of you, when is the last time you identified a new resource for candidates? If you're saying there are no candidates, there are no candidates, every time your recruiters say that to you, you know what I want you to say back to them is, yes, you're right. It's very hard to find candidates. And tonight, I want you to get down on your knees and thank God that it's hard to find candidates because that's when our services are needed the most. If it was easy to find candidates, none of us would have a company, none of us would have a job and neither would the people that you work for. In this candidate-driven marketplace, it's when recruiters are needed more than ever. And so ask candidates where they go and make a commitment that you want everyone that works for you to identify a new resource for, for candidates once a quarter at least, so that they're constantly looking for new resources and they don't keep coming to you saying, we need a new paid resource, we need a new paid resource. And by the way, if you're paying for any resources, you've really got to you look at your return on investment. Are you getting what you're paying for? Job boards only attract 15% of the talent pool. I don't know if you're aware of that, but job boards only attract 15% of the talent pool. And that's what website postings attract too. So when you're paying for postings and you're paying for job board ads, which companies as of 2019, I think the last number I heard from LinkedIn was companies spent $2.5 billion with a B on job board ads and website postings last year, okay? And that only attracts 15% of the talent pool, those people in an active job search. The other 85% is what you should be recruiting. That's what they come to you for, is the other 85% people that are working, they're happy, they'll make a change for the right opportunity. And your team has to position themselves as lifetime career agents. I can help you throughout your whole career. You know, where, what are your long-term goals? What are your short-term goals? Let me help you achieve those. We've got to sound different than everybody out there that's just pitching a job. Client development has also changed. And I do training for talent acquisition professionals too. And they've got the hiring managers that, that, that they must deal with. When you're in the staffing and recruiting profession, you sort of get to pick the clients that you want to work for. But do you have a repeatable sales process? Because if you're not representing the best companies out there, you're going to have a hard time closing deals because candidates know what companies they want to work for. And you've got to represent those companies. You've got to teach your sales team why someone should use them versus the competition. I do this at every convention that I speak at. And it's so funny. I'll ask a room full of recruiters, why should someone use you as opposed to any other recruiter? And they all say the same things. And nobody gives me anything that would make me want to work for them. You know, I represent the best companies. I'm very thorough. You know, I'll, I'll find out what's most important to you. It, it's, and when candidates are hearing this, all they're hearing is wah, 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 because we all sound alike. In fact, most hiring authorities out there, most clients out there, and most job seekers out there think we're all alike. Isn't that sad? Because we're not alike. Nobody has you. Nobody has your team. But if you want to know what business to go after, if you're a staffing and a recruiting firm, you've got to conduct revenue modeling. If you haven't done revenue modeling, then your recruiters don't know what candidates to pipeline and your salespeople don't know what clients to go after. Revenue modeling is going back and figuring out what your best business is. What are the jobs you're writing that you're filling? Not what jobs are you writing? What are you specializing in? You know, there's riches and niches. You've got to know who you are and you've got to share that information with your sales team. Also, when you write a job order, a requisition, a contract, or an assignment, you've got to start getting performance objectives. We started doing this in my company 15 months ago. 
and it has made all the difference in the world. And what's amazing to me is when we ask for performance objectives, and what a performance objective is, what I explained to who I'm working with, by the way, would you tell us what the three to five performance objectives are for this person you wanna hire? And they go, what do you mean? I go, how are you gonna judge them? At the end of a year, I want you to go, God, this was a great hire. So what are the five things my candidate would have had to accomplish in order for, during their performance review, do you go, this was a great hire? What are the three to five things you want them to accomplish? How are you gonna judge them at the end of six months or a year? You know, and, and how are they gonna be judged really successful? And so often when I get performance objectives from these hiring authorities or clients, it's interesting because then I look at the job order they gave me, I look at the what they asked for, that laundry list of skill sets, and they're not even asking for things that will allow this person to achieve what they expect the person to achieve. So if you wanna fill more of the business you're writing, if you want your candidates to be successful, put looking at that laundry list of skills. Also, if your candidate doesn't have one or two things in that laundry list, but they've performed, they've achieved the three to five things that this company needs them to achieve, you can screen them in. It's gonna help you book more interviews. And so that another way client development has changed. Reality number three is there is 80 million millennials and they're driving change and they have different expectations. They, are, they want work-life balance. They want to have meaningful work. Training is very important to them. Career advancement is very important to them. It's not beyond a millennial to go on a job interview and ask about what their next step will be. And you wanna know what's funny is I'm a baby boomer and I find more similarities with the millennials than any other generation out there because they wanted what I wanted when I got out of school. I just didn't ask for it and I don't know why. Um, but I, you know, and, and again, millennials worked, we lived to work, you know, we're all workaholics and we work way too much. Where millennials work to live and I'm kind of jealous. I mean, I love when I, 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 it's, it's, I love this new trend with traveling nurses where they want to work nine months and take three months off and travel and play and then come back and work nine months and then travel for three months. Um, you know, people are going, well, how can they do that? Why not? They're working as a contractor. Why not? You know, we've got to start embracing some of this, okay? They need to know how, you know, and, and why their work matters. And the interesting thing is many millennials are now hiring authorities. And as I was driving into work today, I heard how many companies are embracing a four-day work week. Some are doing four 10-hour days. Some are doing 32-hour work weeks and realizing that their employees are doing more in those 32 hours than when they worked five days at 40 hours because the people appreciate the four-day work week. And guess what? It's the millennials that are driving this. And you might be sitting there going, well, that's ridiculous. All I'm saying to you is you don't have to agree or disagree with everything that another, another generation is doing, but they are the majority and they are driving change. And sometimes you've just got to keep up with the change or they're going to run right over you. It's time to embrace the millennials and stop judging them. Like I said earlier, I just think they're the most over-scrutinized generation. And, you know, and, and when I hear words like they feel entitled in that, well, guess what? Some of that comes from the way their parents raised them and their parents weren't millennials. And so, you know, there, there's a lot of interesting things coming out of this generation. And we've got to start stepping back and realizing that they are driving change and trends that you must keep up with. If you're a recruiter, you must keep up. Um, reality number four is your current team is either helping or hindering you. You're in business to generate profits for your business, not to provide jobs for your employees. You've got to hire people who want to sell. We, we say that recruiting is, you know, it's um, talent acquisition, it's recruiting, it's consulting. We give recruiters a lot of different names. When I first went into this profession, everybody was personnel, and then they became human resource, and now they're talent acquisition. And if you go to a staffing and recruiting firm, there's so many different titles. Every one of you are involved in sales. Recruiting is sales. That's what you do. You sell. And that's why when companies, you say the human resource department is overhead, I'm always going back to these. I speak in front of a lot of corporate audiences, and I keep saying, quit calling human resource and talent acquisition overhead, because without them, they're the heart of your company. They find the talent that keeps your company going. They're selling your company every day of their life. They're selling to, your, to the people that you hire. They're trying to help you retain the people that you employ. You're all involved in sales. And so when you're hiring people, you've got to hire people who want to sell that have history of peak performance. 
if you look at somebody's past history, that's a window into their future. And so you've got to hire people who want to sell. And that's why, you know, recruiters are always sales. You know, if you've got a, a huge human resource department, usually the recruiter is the only person in that department is a pure salesperson because they're not doing employee relations. They're not doing organizational development. They're selling opportunities and they're selling candidates to hiring managers. We're all involved in sales. So you've got to find people that want to sell um, and they have a history of peak performance. And the best you can do is create a motivating environment. If I hear somebody say, my boss is not motivating me, I always say to that person, that's not their job. You've got to motivate yourself. The best they can do is create a motivating environment where you can exceed. And by the way, um, your people will not have a record year in 2020 because you want one. Don't make the same mistake I made for most of my, my, my years being a, a business owner. Probably for the first 15 years I was in business, after Thanksgiving, I would get up in front of my group and I would say, by the way, we are going to have a record year next year. And I had 80 some odd recruiters in my office in Chicago. And I would say, we're going to have a record year. We're going to break, we're going to break all goals. And I roll out incentives and I roll out bonuses and I would roll out all these wonderful things. And I was so excited and I'd look out and I'd see eyes rolling from members of my team. And I'd be up there going, what? Like I just offered them a bunch of stuff and they're rolling their eyes like what's going on. And after my meeting, I'd pull my managers inside and say, okay, I just rolled out great contests, great bonuses. Why were eyes rolling? That's so frustrating for me as an owner. And they go, they're wondering what you're going to do to them, Barb. They're all making great money. They're all very happy. And when you say you're going to have a record year, they don't know what that means. What are you going to do to them? So instead of my team hearing what I was going to do for them, they heard what I was going to do to them. And so I stopped doing that meeting. I stopped saying I was going to have a record year. And instead, what I have everybody that works for me do every year, and if you haven't done this, this is not in your handout, but this is my gift to you. If you want to change and you want your people to be more successful than they are now, they're not going to do it because you want a record year. Have everybody that works for you write down 10 non-negotiable goals for 2020. 10 non-negotiable goals of all part of their life. If they have the best year they've ever had, um, what would they do for the people they love? Because what motivates most of us are the people that we care about. It's ourselves, but it's also the people we care about. And then under each goal, don't just have them write down 10 non-negotiable goals, put five dated action items under each goal. And those are the five steps to attaining the goal. And the steps have to be dated. If you don't do this, if you have your people just set goals, they're not going to achieve them. They become New Year's resolutions. And next year, when you tell them you want them to set goals for 2021, they're going to pull out the goals they wrote this year. They're going to change 2020 to 2021, and they're going to give them to you. So if you want them to really attain a new level of success, have them write down 10 non-negotiable goals in all areas of their life that are important, personal, philanthropic, spiritual, money, career. You, know, you want some things to be career-oriented, but what's important to them? Health. What's important? And then five dated action items and have them post them where they work. You'll never have to motivate them because they're staring at what they want to achieve for themselves and their families. But you have to hold people accountable. If you erased goals, I want to ask you, did people hit their goals in January and February? And if not, what happened to them? Did you erase them? Because if you erased them, what you told your team already this year is that goals aren't real. That you put them up every month, but they don't really have to attain them because if they don't attain them, they're merely going to be erased. And so I, I want to challenge all of you to do something at the end of February. And it's not going to be easy if you've never done this before, but this is very important that you do this. At the end of February, I want you to look at what every person that worked for you was supposed to achieve in January and February. And if they didn't achieve it, take the difference between what they said they were going to do and what they actually did. And I want you to divide that by 10 and add it to the remaining 10 months of the year. And what you tell your team is, I'm not going to let you give up your goals in February. If you had a bad January, bad February, now what are we going to change? And I'm going to give you a number of things today that you can change that are going to help your people produce more. Number five, you've got to offer consistent, comprehensive training. Um, you've got to rotate core materials. Um, you've got to have certain concepts that you know work that you reiterate constantly. And also training is not best use of time for most owners or managers. I find that everybody's got great intentions but they don't really train their team. And you've got to consistently train your seasoned professionals. 
sometimes it's your your season, your 15 and 20 year people that ruin the new hires because number one, they're taking shortcuts. They know who to call and how to call. You know, and sometimes you promote a top producer to be a manager or a trainer, and they're they're not a mentor type. They're you know, top producers are very self-centered. They care about the money. They care about the the thrill of the close of the deal. They don't want to train somebody. And you've got to test when you're training to make sure that your people are retaining the information so they can implement it. Now, I have nine more additional strategies that I'm going to give you on how to increase sales. But for just a minute here, I want to discuss training because training is also a motivator for millennials. If you're serious about increasing sales, we've got a top producer tutor training program. We can give you a free demo of it. And training, I know, directly impacts your increased sales. This is web-based training that takes 15 minutes a day. I do live calls like this one. I do live calls for my training clients once a week. I get on the phone every other Monday and I answer coaching questions. So if anybody that works for you has questions, they can bring them to the live calls. So they have live access to me 10 times a month. And all I want to say to you is if you don't have a structured training program, it's so important that you do that. Employees are not inspired to work harder in order for your company to hit goals. They're just not. They do it for their own reasons. And I can tell you, we've trained over 30,000 recruiters in the last 15 years, and 100% of our clients increase sales and profits. Um, if you own our tutor, there's five benefits you would enjoy. You can easily add to your team and not have to train them. Your business is still going to flourish if something happens to one of your top producers. The systems can be duplicated, sales and profits increase, and you will attain goals. Now, I'm going to give you nine more you know, sales tips as soon as I'm done just giving you a little more information on the tutor. The tutor offers you best practices, also legal and tra sales training. It's an 80 day curriculum, 15 minutes a day. And again, there's a lot of live interaction. And I think that live interaction is important because people learn when they're asking questions, they learn when, when they have interaction with other people. There's also a library with 300 recorded webinars. And the training webinars are just like I'm doing for you right now. They have to write daily notes so that you know that they're reading the training and there's a weekly test and you can see the scores because that ensures retention. And they can also hear questions that are being asked by me from people all over the world. And I think it's good for your people to hear other people that they're facing the same issues and they learn from the questions and they learn from the coaching calls. And also our training helps you manage by numbers and not emotion. It's really lonely at the top when you're an owner or a manager, but it's even lonelier at the bottom. If you want a demo of this program, please write down that number and call for a demo. And we're going to put a bonus at the end of this program um, that, that will basically be only for the people on this call. Now let's get to a, some additional sales tips. Your team must be working from the same playbook. And so you want to have repeatable sales and systems. So there should be, like you should have a system for, you know, when a person first applies for a job, what is your, your process? Are your, are your people asking all the identical questions? You know, do you have a follow-up and nurture program? You know, if you're going to place somebody or if you don't, what do you do to the people that apply to your company that you can't help? Because, you know, staffing and recruiting firms only place 5% of the candidates they attract. The other 95%, they're either not in your niche, they don't have the skills to build an experience. What do you do with them? Because they're the ones that get on social media and blast you. Do you realize 100% of the people that come to you for a job expect you to either hire them or find them a job? And so what system do you have in place? What, what, what resources are you providing for the people you're not helping so that they're still going to give you referrals and recommendations? You've got to set up your business like a franchise. If one of your employees right now, one of your recruiters got, got ill and all of a sudden could come to work for six weeks, what happens? Could anybody sit down and pick up where they left off? Because if the answer is no, that has to be fixed. And you've got to implement a repeatable sales process, whether you have outside salespeople, inside salespeople. If you don't know the process, you can't identify where you need to improve. And I believe in role playing. I think if you really want to make your team more effective, do you know where they all are really bad? They're all really bad in three areas. They can't overcome simple objections. They can't overcome whether it's an objection from a hiring authority or an objection from a candidate. They're, they're terrible at overcoming objections and they don't really know why someone should use them versus someone else. They don't know their personal brand. You've got to role play. And as you're role playing with them, you can hear what they're doing and revise what they're saying. 
That is the only way to increase sales and profits. Five final tips to increase your sales and profits. You've got to clearly communicate your role. If you're a working owner or manager and you're still producing, you can't have an open door policy. People can talk to you first thing in the morning, uh, midday and at the end of the day. And every time somebody asks you a question um, that works for you, I want you to all give everybody the same answer to the question. You might think, how's that possible? Anytime someone asks you a question who works for you, I want you to answer them with this. What is your solution? Because usually it's the person that doesn't want to get on the phone. It's the lowest producer. It's the employee that's on the fence that asks you the most questions because it's easier to ask you questions than it is to just work their desk. So every time somebody asks you a question, if they learn you're going to answer what is your solution, all of a sudden they're like, wait a minute, I better come up with a solution. And you want people to think for themselves. You don't want to feel like they're all connected to you by an umbilical cord because that doesn't grow your business. You've got to teach people what you know, not do it for them. You can't be the brain for everybody that works for you. You've got to teach them what you know and get them very independent. So you've got to clearly communicate your role. You've got to maintain your own inspiration and embrace change. When you're an owner or manager, it can be tough. When, when things are not working the way you want them to work, you can be under a lot of pressure. And that's why you've got to maintain your own inspiration and you've got to embrace change as an owner. If you haven't changed things in years, you've got to change them. Even, even your vendors that you're using, you could probably get better pricing. You, you've got to constantly embrace change as a leader. And you've got to be predictable and consistent. Your team cannot wonder which version of you is going to come to work today. It's interesting because people always ask me, are you always happy? I wake up happy. That's who I am. Am I always happy? I mean, there's things that happen in my life that I guess should upset me, but I've just chosen. I laugh before I cry and I never focus on problems. I always look at, oh, I instantly go to what is the solution? There's a lot of rejection in what we do. There's a lot of negativity um, and I choose not to listen to it. I don't listen to the news. I don't read the newspaper. I read business publications because good news doesn't, doesn't you know, sell advertising. And this country is split in half, and I don't know, want to know what side you're on. I just want to be on the side of helping people advance their careers and helping everybody that works for me or anybody that interacts with me. I want them to be better off for the experience of having met me. That's my goal in life. Also, how do you reset the financial thermostats of your team? If you have someone who's never earned big money and you say you can earn $100,000 a year in this profession, they can't even relate to that. And plus, you forget to tell them they can also earn minimum wage if they're not good at this. You know, unless you have them set their own goals and they reset their financial thermostat higher, they're never going to produce more. I don't care what you do. It's got to be that they want to buy a new home, a new car. They want to send their kids to the best college. They want to really enhance their retirement fund. Depends on where they are in life. You know, if they ever say, I don't like my car, I don't like the house, they can change it. You know, they can change that, but they have to realize that you've got to help them reset their financial thermostat and automate your systems. You know, automate as much as you can. If you're not using autoresponders, you should use those because those enhance the efforts of your recruiting team. Look at the things you can automate, you know, and, and again, everybody has great intentions to nurture and touch and do all those things but they get very busy. We're very busy right now. So, you know, make sure that you're looking at systems that can automate. Do you have Google alerts set up on every client you represent so that you're getting the latest, greatest information? You know, are you, are you using all the free tools out there? Like Crystal knows, are you using tools that give you information um, on the people you're going to contact? There's so much out there. There's just so much good information out there. But again, You've got to be the leader. It's like, you know, I remember when I was in, I went to Catholic grade school and they asked us to draw the Mickey Mouse character, the, the, the Disney character we wanted to be. And I drew Mickey Mouse. And I never forget the nun came up to me and she said, I said, Barb, you can't be Mickey Mouse. You have to be Minnie Mouse. And I said, I don't like Minnie Mouse. I want to be Mickey Mouse. And she goes, why? And I said, because he leads the band. And you asked me what Disney character, and, and I was young. And it was just funny because she would not let me be Mickey Mouse. She made me draw Minnie Mouse. And so I didn't go to Minnie Mouse. I think I, I forget who I drew. Oh, then I, I started wanting to be Goofy because I was so angry that she wouldn't let me be Mickey Mouse that I just chose Goofy to be funny because I have a funny sense of humor. But I went home and complained to my mother. And I said, you know what? 
even though Mickey Mouse is a boy, he's still the leader when they're asking us what we want to be. You know, I'm the leader of my Girl Scout troop. Why can't I be Mickey Mouse? Well, my mother went to school with me the next day. And, you know, ever since then, you know, the girls could put down whatever they wanted to be. Um, but again, you have to you have to stand back and you have to communicate your role. You might have a lot of leaders that work for you. You might have people that work for you that can do some of your social media that would love to do that. You know, yes, they're a recruiter, but they can help you with other things. Take advantage. Take advantage of all the skill sets and never be afraid to 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 you know aim your goals high but then you've always got to show everybody around you how it benefits them to embrace the changes that you are benefiting it's great for you to be a leader it's great for you to want to implement change and anticipate trends but you've got to get the buy-in of everybody around you or it doesn't work you know often when i go to companies and i'm doing in-house training i find that it's not the team it's the leader that needs the training and so don't be afraid to admit to yourself that maybe you need some training. You know, maybe you have to embrace change more or you got to relate to the different generations better in order to get the results that you want. Always, every time you point the finger out at somebody else, remember three fingers, three fingers are pointing back at you. What can you change? Timing is everything. You've got to inspire your team in the right order. You've got to do things yourself first. You've got to make changes yourself. You've got to embrace change yourself first and then doing things at the right time. I mean, obviously, I think starting now to implement some of the changes that we've talked about, you know, you've got it. It's not enough to come to this webinar. What I would love to tell all of you to do is just think of three things that I said that you're going to change. Change one in March, one in April and one in May, because if you go and try to change too much, you're going to end up changing nothing. If you come out of this webinar and you have three changes, and by the way, all of you connect with me on LinkedIn because those courses I did for LinkedIn, they let me release two courses last year free. I literally, they called me in the morning, like at seven o'clock, they sent me a, an, an email and said, Barb, we're gonna let you release one of your courses for 24 hours to your LinkedIn followers. So make sure all of you follow me on LinkedIn. And also I would love for you to share with me on LinkedIn, what did you learn today? What are those ideas that you're gonna implement or even what excites me more and keeps me training? I would love to hear your success story 60 or 90 days from now. Like, what did you do? You can't just come to this webinar and then get off the webinar and not do anything. We're going to send you the recording, you know, but I want you to figure out what is the first change you're going to do starting tomorrow. And, and the other thing I want to say to all of you is please have your people before March 1st, have them write down their 10 non-negotiable goals with five dated action items. It'll change their life and it'll change your life. You don't have to motivate someone who is trying to get their kids to the best schools or wants to buy a house. They'll motivate themselves. You just have to create that motivating environment. So make sure, I don't want that goal to be, I don't want the 10 goals to be one of your ideas. That's my homework for all of you. One last fact, 100% of the tutor clients we have that utilize our program replace old habits with new ones. They make subtle changes that provide results and I improve their time management. It's not about the hours you work. It's about what you do with your time. And so and for the first five people that call in, or that actually the first five people that invest in my, uh, my tutor, I also have a strategic management tutor that teaches you how to manage recruiters. And it's 26 lessons for owners and managers. So the first five people who invest uh, in, in our tutor are going to get that strategic management tutor. Also, once you own our tutor, there, there are seats that are involved in the tutor. And what you do with the tutor is you, um, you know, you basically just buy a seat for people. And so anybody who invests in the tutor by March 16th, we're also going to give you five seats free. So uh, please call my office. You've got the number on there. I want to see if that, that is the last screen. Um, it's a 30 minute demo. It's 30 minutes of your time. And if nothing else, look at my demo and see what you have to develop for your own company. Now, I want to open the lines for questions. I know I've taken a lot of your time, but this was very important training, and I usually only train for 30 minutes, um, but I wanted to give you all I could um, since I haven't done a free webinar for a couple months. Uh, please connect with me on LinkedIn. Please give me your feedback. I really encourage all of you to call and, and set up a demo. Uh, you are going to get the recording of this. I only see one question, so let me go to the question. Now, you can ask questions by um, either going to the um, doing to going to the control panel on the right and clicking on attendee. And if you click that little hand, um, I can unmute you and you and I can talk, or 
you can go to the bottom where it says questions and type in a question. Thanks for sharing your knowledge. Let's see, hold on a second here. I've got a bunch of questions. Wait, let me get to the top of this. Thanks for sharing your knowledge. I met you in South Africa many years ago and still follow your wisdom. Thank you. Janine, I'm so glad. Yes, I spent a month in South Africa. I do travel you know, all over the place to do recruiting training and my month in South Africa was wonderful. Let's see, oh my God, so true, I have two middle schoolers. Thanks for validating. Yeah, Annabelle, don't you think like, I wanted to give all five of my kids up for adoption when they were in, uh, when they were in junior high. It's 50%, not 15, 5 Millennials now represent over 50% of the workforce and by, uh, by 2015, they will represent 75%. What is crystal knowledge? It's not crystal knowledge, it's crystal knows. And write this down, everybody. I was at a conference and I had somebody ask me, they, they were going to display crystal nose. And I'm like, what is crystal nose? And they said, let's, let's pick somebody in the audience that everybody knows. And I was speaking at this convention. And so before I know it, the speaker put my LinkedIn profile in front of all these attendees at a conference. Well, I stood up instantly and I said, I don't know Crystal. I don't think Crystal knows me. Like, what are you talking about? And he said, Barbara, Crystal, know, Crystal knows a lot about Barbara Bruno. And I said, really? And he goes, you want to see what she knows? Well, I'll be honest with you, I was nervous because here's my LinkedIn profile in front of a conference that I'm addressing for the next entire day. And this guy is going to tell them things about me. So he pulls up Crystal Knows. And this is what Crystal Knows said about me. It said, when you address Barbara Bruno, don't call her Barbara. Don't call her Mrs. Bruno. Call her Barb. Call, be informal. She's more informal and very friendly. Um, if you talk too much, if you give her the editorial, she's not going to listen. She only reads bullet points. If you send her an email, only put two or three bullet points and make it short and sweet. And don't be don't be vague. She's pretty black and white, right or wrong, black or white. And so if you're going to interact with her, don't 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 put a lot of fluff. Get down to facts and numbers. She'll relate better. And if you can make her laugh, she has a great sense of humor and enjoys dealing with people that are humorous. OK, when that came up on the screen, I was amazed. How did Crystal know those things about me? Those are not on my LinkedIn profile, you know, and, and by the way, it's spot on. People that were sitting with me that know me, they just went, oh, my God, that is so spot on. That's ridiculous. Like, how did Crystal? I, and so the, the resource is Crystal Knows. It's C-R-Y-S-T-A-L-K-N-O-W-S.com. It's a Chrome extension that you can download free. I've got 100 of these things that are out there. I mean, it's just it's amazing, all the resources. But this is a good one. So it's Crystal Knows, C-R-Y-S-T-A-L-K-N-O-W-S. And what you do is you type, you, you download the Chrome extension and then you type in somebody's name. And what it does is it scans this person's social media uh, presence. And I have a very large social media presence and it pulls things and it does a mini disc profile on them. So it literally does an assessment on them. Now, Crystal Knows only lets you do so many for free and then you have to start paying. And, and they also have a more in-depth you know, profile that you have to pay for. I don't pay for Crystal Knows. We run, you know, Crystal Knows, we just don't run that many a day. But wouldn't you love to have that information before you call a client? You you know everything about them. I came back and did it on like my, my accounting person, knowing she doesn't have a large social media presence. I did it on my mom, who has next to no social media presence when she was still alive. And, and it was interesting because uh, it was spot on with everybody. So that's just one of the tools that that I, anytime I find something, I use them in my company, and then I share it with my with my training clients. Let's see. We don't work blended desk. I'm in sales. My recs are going unfilled, and the team can't keep up with the volume of orders that we have. I need advice to get the recruiters resourced or find a way to get them to find talents our client are requesting. Okay, what I'm telling you is what you have to what you have to do is you have to do revenue modeling. You said that they are consistently in the top ten jobs we fill, but then what you have to do is you have to teach the recruiters how to pipeline in advance, you know, because again, um, you know, and what I would do with your orders in order to get your orders, but when you write an order, get a target date to fill so they know what, what orders are the hottest and then get three interviewing times and a target date to fill. Then they'll see the urgency of filling the orders and get three selling points on the company that, that they're not going to find online. Make sure that your recruiters have Google alerts set up so they know the latest, greatest. They got to get excited about the, the companies and about the jobs, you know, and, it, and if you don't have enough recruiters, go to the owner and just merely say, don't say the recruiters are not filling my job because as an owner, I don't want to hire. But if you say, I've got something that's costing us a ton of money, 
Look at all the business we're writing that's not being filled. That's costing you a ton of money. I might have to hire some new recruiters. Do any of your suggestions about manager recruiters vary contingent upon their division or industry focus? Your suggestions on how to manage recruiters of a senior level vary compared to recruiters who will fill manual? Yeah, absolutely, yes, Megan. I think that it's very different. If I'm working in a fast-paced, light industrial temp firm, I have to manage people much differently than if they're doing retained search of, of the C-suite. It's just a different type of management. I also manage levels of people different. I mean, you, you, you manage according to your niche, according to the level you're placing in, and also, you know, how much experience do they have? You know, again, you can't, you can't manage a brand new person the way you're going to manage a tenured big biller, but that big biller still needs your attention. So yes, you do manage very differently. Um, let's see, verbal example of how to approach candidates as we recruit them for a job. Okay, so Tom, say that I'm recruiting you and I'm gonna say, Tom, I was so inspired to call you. I saw your LinkedIn profile and I've helped 17 people with your experience advance their careers since the beginning of the year. I would love to have the opportunity to do that for you as well. But what I would need to do is set up a discussion between you and I where I could learn what is most important to you. What do you see as your next career move? You know, I don't want to assume that what you're doing is what you want to do next. When can we talk? So my, my brand is my track record. You've got to tell people, I've placed X amount of people with your experience inside. I've, not that I've placed them, placed is our words. I've helped this amount of people advance their careers in the last 90 days. Would love to give you those same results. That's just one of the recruiting calls I make, but that's a quick example of what you could say. I hope that helped you. Apart from referrals, what is your number one favorite way to reach passive candidates? We're not heavy LinkedIn users. Um, I think that 40% of your candidates, if you've been doing this longer than, than 18 months, 40% of your candidates and new clients should come from referrals. You should have a client referral program and a candidate referral. And the other way that we find passive candidates, and we have over 60% of our candidates and new clients come from referrals, but we've worked at that and we have very good employee referral programs and client referral programs. But the rest of it are the free resources. It's going out there and networking with people and making the call you just heard me make, you know, that we've helped so many people advance their careers, would love to do the same for you. And so we position ourselves out there and we have people coming to us because they know what we do. A percentage of positions that are filled by job boards. I don't know that, Miriam, we don't use job boards. I've never used a job board. I don't pay for any resources for my recruiters, none. We have no paid resources. Um, all of you will get the recording of this call. Um, and again, I have somebody that, that says that they're not getting the audio, but I have hundreds of people on this line. And so I don't know why that one person is not getting. Let's see, I'm new to recruiting, but have found that I have more candidates looking for work and I'm finding it hard to find the clients for the candidates. You don't find clients for candidates. You find you, our job. Okay, let me give you an example, Brad. If I had, uh, if I told you I wanted you to get me a red brand new uh, Lexus, and I wanted white interior, and I wanted all the, the I want every, everything on it, I want a sunroof, and I want a heated steering wheel. Could you find that for me? The answer is yes, okay? Um, and so, again, you know, that's easy to do, but if I had a red Lexus with white interior and a heated steering wheel, and how hard is it for you to find a buyer for that? Our job is to use, ask your candidates where they want to work, market them to companies, but our job is to fill orders. Our job is not to find a job for a candidate. Um, what are your thoughts on recruiting networks like Top Echelon? I think that I, if you get the return, you've got to find out how many members do in your niche. How many members of a network place what you place and then they can be very lucrative. They can be very lucrative. Let's see, I see no other questions. Um, yes, it is the first five. I have somebody talk about the first five. The first five that invest in my top producer are going to get the strategic management tutor free. And um, if you invest by the date, then you will also get five licenses. So five people can go through the training. Um, and that's worth $250 because it's a $50 per person. So I thank all of you for your time. I have spent an hour with all of you. I will send you the recording. I, I'm telling you that um, I change my training constantly to keep up with trends. And just imagine the value of a live call like this for your team where I can become your training. Every Wednesday at 11 Central Standard Time, I do a 30 minute webinar and 30 minutes of Q&A for your team. Every other Monday, I do one hour of coaching where people just ask me questions. How do you put a price on that? And my, co my coaching and my training is very current because I'm out there. 
And so, you know, I, I would really strongly suggest as many of you as possible, set up the demo at least, at least look at it. And if you're not going to invest in what we have, at least it'll give you the type of training that you need to develop for your team. So I appreciate all your time. I hope you connect with me on LinkedIn and please send me your success stories. I love to hear what ideas work. So thanks for joining me. And I hope you have a record breaking last 10 months of 2020. Thank you.